Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hello, Olivia, Anna, Anthony. How are you all doing? Hello. Um, morning and welcome to day one of National University Week. Hello, Ali. Um, my name's Heather. I'm from Career Map. And um, to kick us off this week, I'm being joined by Jonathan from the University of Kent. Um, Jonathan will be talking you through everything that you need to know and consider when you're choosing a course and a university. Uh, so before I hand over to Jonathan, I'll just do a bit of housekeeping for you. So um, some of you have already found the chat box already. Um, you're all saying very sprightly good mornings, which is lovely. Um, hello, Shauna. Um, ask any questions that you've got throughout the presentation in the chat box, and then we will do a Q&A at the end of the presentation with Jonathan. So we'll collate all of the questions and we'll do like a little session at the end. Um, the session is being recorded, so um, it will be sent to you via email. So don't worry about missing anything. Um, you'll have it um, land with you in your inbox in the not too distant future. Um, but apart from that, it's really time for me to hand over to Jonathan um introduce him and um hello morning everybody and um and i will see you for the q a fantastic thanks so much for that Hello. that's absolutely brilliant so um yeah as i said my name is jonathan just a quick introduction before we get started um i work for the university of kent in our student recruitment team and as one of our recruitment officers so my job is to deliver presentations like this um to people such as yourselves who are interested in in university, maybe going into higher education, um, both virtually um, and in person is how I do these typically, um, and going to big UCAS fairs and things like that. So I spend a lot of my time talking to people about their options for university, or whether that's even university at all. Anyway, over the next uh, kind of half an hour, 40 minutes or so, I'm just gonna talk through a few slides around that subject of, yeah, how to go about choosing a course in university. So this is a big decision. So it's helpful to you know give you some tips about things to look out for, maybe things that you haven't considered. And when you're doing your research into different universities, hopefully uh, get you to a point where you can uh, make the right decision for yourself. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a start. So really, you know, the question of, um, you know, how do you go about choosing um, the right university or the right course for you? Um, it's entirely down to the individual, uh, which sounds like a little bit of a cop-out answer, but the fact is that really, you know, the question is, what is it that's important to you? Because every different person going to university um, will have different priorities, they'll have different key things that they want out of their experience. So depending on what those things are, that will play very heavily into where they choose to go for university. So it might be that you're somebody that's really invested in a particular subject. That might be you know, a, an entire degree title, or it might just be even a specific area within a subject that you've chosen. So it might be that within history, let's say, um, you're really, really interested in medieval history. Uh, or it might be that you're just really looking forward to studying, let's say, psychology um, more in general. Might be something else entirely, and you know, it might be particular career prospects that you've got in mind. Maybe you're very, very invested in the idea of becoming, um, you know, a certain job um, down the line. So that's going to very much dictate um, what career, or sorry, what um, course you're going to go into in order to facilitate your further progression into that career path. And it can be other things as well, you know, general things just like, you know, how much money do you have to spend when you're at university? Is it maybe a particular friends or family in a certain location that you want to be close to? There are no right or wrong answers to any of this. I've just got some general categories here on the screen, but you know, the list could be potentially endless. Um, so really, it's a question of, at the outset, thinking about, you know, what is it that's important to you? Because you're the one that's making the decision at the end of the day. It's great to take advice from other people. Um, but at the end, they think about what are your priorities going to university. And hopefully that's something that we can kind of draw out through the rest of the presentation as well. So for most people, uh, the main motivating factor behind their university choice was um, subject choice was the course that they were doing. Here we just got a quick survey that was taken um, a few years ago of asking students why they chose to go to their particular university. And you can see for almost half of them, um, it was their subject choice. It was the course itself was the main reason that they went to that university. But you can see there are a lot of other factors also playing in. So for you know, one in five people, it was university reputation um, and other things as well, like being close to home, for example. But lots and lots of different reasons that people choose to go to the courses that they do. It's about working out which reason is going to be most important for you. The good news is that when it comes to subject choice, you know, that main uh, motivating factor behind most people's choice, um, that's not really going to be a limiting factor for you. So um, there's over, actually this number needs to be updated, but there's over um, 350 different institutions um, in the UK now listed on UCAS and they offer over 35,000 different courses. 
So really the world is your oyster when it comes to choosing a university subject to study. No matter how obscure it is, there's probably going to be something out there for you. So for example, in my own case, um, I studied at the University of Kent a few years ago, um, and my degree was in military history. So quite a, you know, obviously history is quite a common area of study, you get that at most universities, but military history specifically is a much more focused one. And again, it was kind of going back to that course content point that I was just saying, that was something I was really invested in studying. Um, so that's really helped narrow down my course choice if you have a particularly um, kind of niche interest. But what it means is that, as I say, regardless of what it is that you want to study, there's probably going to be a course out there, if not several courses out there that are suitable for your interest. Now, that's great, but it is also a challenge because it can sometimes then feel like, you know, with so much choice, how do you go about narrowing that down to the one, two, three, you know, the five choices that you can put on your UCAS form? It can feel a little bit like uh, finding a needle in a haystack in some cases. So to help with that, you know, we've identified these four key sort of touchstones um, that we think can be helpful for making that process. So that is firstly, you know, the type of course itself or information about the course and its content. And then also the choice between a campus and a city university. So this presentation is really kind of split into two halves. The first half is we're going to be talking about the academic side of the university, the course itself, how it's assessed, how it's taught, what you can get out of it, things like that. And we'll also progress on to the non-academic side of life, because it's worth remembering that actually university isn't just about the course you study. It's about the place that you go to, the accommodation that you live in, the people that you meet, all that kind of stuff as well. So that should also factor into your decision making process about your course and your university. So first off, looking at course content and just a few things that I do want to highlight for people that they might not necessarily be aware of right at the outset. And the first one of those is that it's really, really important to make sure that you look into what is actually taught on different courses at different universities, because this will vary quite broadly from institution to institution, even if the titles are the exact same. So you could have, we've got an example here, which is the history degree um, at Birmingham and at Kent. You can see they've actually both got the exact same title. They're both just called BA History. But when you look beneath the surface, there's kind of two main areas of variance that you have. So first one is going to be how much choice do you have um, in determining what topics you cover on the course? And the second will be what those topics actually are. So when I say um, topics, we, we refer to them as modules at university. When I say modules, that's just a system that we use to break up university courses. You'll take a certain number of modules in a given year, maybe um, six, eight, ten, depending on how valuable they are. But when I say modules, just think topics. So here, for example, you know, as I say, we've got the University of Birmingham History Review and the University of Kent. You can see there's a list of compulsory and optional modules in both here. At Birmingham, you've got these five compulsory modules, and then you've got two optional modules. What that means is with the compulsory modules, as the name would suggest, everybody does those five modules. And um, you don't have a choice. Everybody sits there and does those as standard. And then with the optional modules, you pick maybe um, one out of those two um, that are listed at the bottom there. Now with the University of Kent's history degree, we just have the one optional module, sorry, the one compulsory module that everybody would do. And then we've got this whole list of optional modules there, what's that, maybe 10 or 12 optional modules. And of those, you would pick probably five or six maybe to make up the rest of the complement of your modules for that given year. And this is some this is a process that you repeat year on year as well, I should imagine. Um, but what is again the point that I want to make here is that firstly, you know, one university is offering you a lot more choice around what topics you cover than another. Now it might be that you're somebody that actually prefers to just have the curriculum set for you and you can just get on um, and study it. Or you might be somebody else that prefers having a bit more freedom and a bit more flexibility in the topics that you actually cover. So it's worth you know, looking into how much choice a university course will give you in determining your own learning and your own content. Also, what I will point out is that this will vary from course to course. Certain types of courses will be a bit more prescriptive around the content that you have to do, whereas others might be a bit more flexible. So things like the humanities, so history, English, film, um, whatever it might be you'll probably have a bit more say around what modules you can take. They'll give you more optional modules than compulsory in most cases. However, with certain courses like, um, for example, medicine, veterinary science, things like the hard sciences or accounting, chances are they're going to be a bit more prescriptive around what you have to do. You won't have as much freedom, especially with something like medicine. Obviously, they need to guarantee that everybody is taking the same content because uh, they're going into a very important career path afterwards. So you won't really have any choice around what it is that you're studying. But on certain courses that you might be looking into, you might get varying degrees of freedom to determine what modules you get to take while you're at university. And then obviously the actual content of those modules 
will vary as well. This can be for a number of reasons. It might be the university has specific facilities that can um, help with certain types of teaching, or it might be that the particular academics of that university specialize in certain areas. But again, sticking with the history example, it might be that um, you know the history degree at University A has a lot of medieval history content in it. Um, and then the University um, B history course um, has you know, no medieval content at all. It's very focused on, uh, let's say, American history instead. So if you're somebody going to university wanting to study history, those two courses on the surface look the exact same. They're both just called history. But if you're particularly into medieval history, let's say, then you'd be much better served going to University A with all this medieval content versus University B where it's got none of it. So it's why it's really, really important that you scratch beneath the surface of just what the course titles are and see what they actually teach on those courses in each year and what the modules on offer are. This is all the information that's publicly accessible. And um, this is all just through university websites. If you go onto websites, do a course search, you can see a lot more detail about what's actually taught on that course, along with everything else besides as well. So something I really, really strongly recommend doing. But again, what I mainly want to get across with this slide is just that courses will, might have the same name um, at different universities, but chances are they will be very, very different beneath the surface. Entry requirements are obviously another big variance between courses at different universities. And this is, again, something that's really important to bear in mind because this will help you narrow down your options quite a lot. Obviously, people work at different levels of attainment in their academic life um, at school or college. So it's important that you find courses that are matched to your kind of reasonable expectations of how you're going to do in your A-level or BTEC, IB, whatever it might be. Because, you know, what is great to be aspirational and maybe push yourself with some of the choices that you've got. Um, you know, if you are working at a three B's level and you're applying for all universities that require two A's and an A star, um, chances are that might not you know, be the best way for you to get onto one of those courses. So rather it is, um, it's important to be realistic around this. And make sure that you're, you know, having conversations with your tutors, with your teachers as well. And they can help you work out, you know, what you might reasonably be looking to attain um, in your qualifications. So firstly, that's a good way to, again, narrow down what a lot of your options might be, and that might um, you know, discount some universities for you. And then there's also other things to bear in mind because there will be certain um, qualifying factors or certain specifics around university entry requirements that are worth bearing in mind. So again, we've got the example of history um, at Kent and at Birmingham. And here at Kent, your requirement is um, A-level, three Bs, fairly standard requirement. Um, and that has to include some kind of humanity essay-based subject. So that could be history, but it could also be politics, philosophy, English, religious studies, whatever it might be. You don't have to have taken history at A-level to do the history degree at Kent. Now at Birmingham, the requirement is for two A's and a B, so slightly higher. And in this case, you have to have taken history in some form. So either A-level history, uh, medieval history, ancient history, um, and that has to be at a grade A as well. So it's a little bit more restrictive um, around the entry requirements there. This could be for all sorts of different reasons. It could be the university's reputation and various other things. Um, but what it means is that, for example, if you were currently studying a certain list of subjects um, at A-level, you might be allowed, you might not be able to go on and do certain subjects um, at a particular university if you haven't taken that required subject. So let's say you were studying right now, um, you know, chemistry, maths, physics, um, but you decide actually, yeah, I would like to go on and do, I'd like to change direction entirely and pursue my interest in history. Um, unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to go to the University of Birmingham, for example, because you haven't studied history at A-level. However, other universities would potentially be open to you. So again, worth bearing in mind that entry requirements might also narrow down some of your options, both in the level of attainment that you're currently working at and also the subjects that you're currently taking, because um, you might not be able to go to certain universities or get to certain courses with the A-levels that you've got. Method of study um, is another way that courses will be varied between different unis. So method of study at university will vary from things like lectures. That's kind of what you imagine your quintessential university teaching session, what you see in the media most commonly represented. You've got a big tiered lecture theater with you know, maybe 100, 200 students sitting there watching somebody give a presentation for an hour while they take notes. And also things like seminars, whereby it's more, much more of a discussion based small group learning style. You might have 15, 20 students in a classroom. You'll sit around and chat through some questions for an hour or two with a seminar leader leading the discussion perhaps. And also other things as well, like practical workshops. If you're doing you know, practical based subject, maybe like computer science or engineering, things like tutorials, which are much more of a one-to-one -one or a one-to-two um, style of learning perhaps. And then also the balance between um, self-study and contact hours. So when I say contact hours, that's your formal timetable classes, your lecture seminars, workshops, tutorials that I just mentioned. 
self-study is then your independent learning time so going to the library and doing your own reading or working on your essays at home things like that so make sure that you can look into how different courses are taught because again they will have information on their websites about you know how many lectures does each module have um, in a given week or in a term you know how many seminars are there and you know are you marked on seminar participation also, how much practical time is there or how much practical content is there on a given course if you're looking at a practical based course? And again, what is the split between self study and contact hours? It's again worth noting that certain courses will be much more contact hour heavy than others. So things like your again, medicine, hard sciences, law, for example, um, will generally have a lot more contact hours than something like, you know, history, English literature, whatever else it might be. So sorry to keep harping back onto uh, history. As I said, I'm a former history student myself, so I always draw on that example. But you know, hopefully, um, hopefully that's helping you anyway. Um, but what it means is, yeah, this is information you can find on university websites, so you can see how much teaching you're actually getting and how much of it will just be independent study and what kind of teaching that will be. And then method of assessment is another form of variance as well, whereby you know it'd be typical to maybe what you're used to at school or college already, whereby you'll probably have a mixture of exams and coursework whereby you know, coursework being essays, practical assignments, um, in-class tests perhaps, um, as well as things like being marked on seminar participation or presentations. And then exams being your classic sitting in you know, maybe a big sports hall with a table and working through a paper for two hours or so um, and just getting marked on that at the end of the year. Different courses and different universities will place emphasis on different areas. It might be that you can go onto certain courses and take 100% coursework assessed modules, for example. That was something I was able to do at university. It might be that actually one university leans much more heavily into exam and, you know, 60% of marks in a given year are from exam instead of coursework. So if you have a strength in either direction, if you really, really prefer, prefer coursework over exam, for example, you can perhaps try and get onto courses or look into universities that um, play a bit more to your strength in that regard. And again, method of assessment is something that will be available in the module, kind of outline the module summaries and that you can find on university websites. Another quick way that you can make your university experience a bit more unique and something else to look out for when you're browsing courses are opportunities to go abroad. So year abroad programs are a type of sandwich year whereby um, at the University of Kent at least and at many other universities around the country, um, you would do two years of study at the university. And then you go away for a year overseas and either study at an overseas university or perhaps work for an employer overseas. And then you come back at the end of that to your home university and you do a fourth and final year of study. So it's called a sandwich year because you've got a period of study, a period away, and then a period of study again. And a three year course becomes a four year course at this point because the year abroad is an additional year that's added in part way through. Now, this is a really, really fantastic opportunity and something that I would you know, really recommend thinking about. Um, for university, you know, it's a good way to make your experience a bit more unique, vary um, your kind of learning environment and experience. It's just good fun in many cases as well. You've got to go to some really exotic places. You know, friends of mine went to Istanbul, for example. Other students have been as far as Japan or the United States and all across Europe as well. So you get to go to some really, really amazing locations, meet all kinds of great people, broaden your experience of the world, and also develop a lot of skills in the process and qualities while you're doing so. You know, it does take resilience. Um, you know, to overcome the challenges of living in another country, especially if there's a language barrier, as there will be in many cases, you know, a lot of personal confidence and adaptability to get out of it. And that's something that actually re reflects really well on you if it comes to applying for jobs or for further study down the line as well. Obviously, I would point out that there are some courses where a year abroad will be a compulsory element. So if you're studying languages, for example, um, typically you'd be expected, let's say you're studying French, you'd be expected to still spend a year in a French speaking nation as part of your degree. But for many people, this is actually just an optional extra that they will choose to add on to their course just because they want to, you know, not because they do anything that's particularly related to, you know, overseas study or living overseas, but just because it's an interesting opportunity, as I just said, and they want to do so to make themselves stand out a bit and to mix up their experience. So again, something that's really worth considering and universities will advertise which of their courses have year abroad opportunities. So if it's something you might be interested in, then do look into that because some unis will have a lot more of these go abroad opportunities than others just based on what partnerships they have, how much funding they have, things like that as well. The year in industry is the other side of the coin when it comes to sandwich years. This works very similarly um, to the year abroad, whereby you've got two years of study and then one year out. But rather than going overseas to another university, rather you go into a workplace generally related to the degree that you've been studying. 
So you do two years of study, one year in industry or on placement. And then after that, you come back and again, you do a fourth and final year of study at the university. So on screen here, I've just got some quick examples of where um, some VAR students have been on their placements with the course they were studying on the left and the employer that they went to on the right, just to give you some examples. But again, this is a really fantastic opportunity for many of the same reasons that I just said um, about the year abroad that also applies here in terms of you know developing things like confidence, adaptability, you know, overcoming the challenges of a new environment. But this is also a lot more course specific as well, or kind of relevant to the course, because obviously you're getting to firstly apply all the knowledge that you've gained for the first two years of study in a practical setting. You can see how the theory actually works out in reality. And the people that you're working alongside for that year are probably going to be um, you know, experts in their field. Oftentimes, you know, there'll be people who've been working there for quite some time and they can give you a lot of insight as well. Methods and kind of techniques that you can maybe take back for your fourth and final year of study back at university. So it benefits you very much in an intellectual sense. And also, in many cases, you can receive payment for these placements, too. So our placement students get paid the equivalent of roughly of what an apprentice would be paid. So maybe 18, 20,000 pounds, depending on where you are in the country. So you get paid for doing so. And then also it's a really, really good way for you to network with employers and potentially get your foot in the door with a graduate employer. So, for example, a friend of mine, um, while I was at university, he did a year in industry with the Office of National Statistics as part of his economics degree. So he spent a year in Cardiff working for the ONS. And then at the end of that year, they actually said to him, um, you, you know, you're a good addition to our team. Really like having you around. If you would like to have a full time job here, we'll give you one at the completion of your studies. So he went back to university after his year in industry, completed his fourth and final year, and then he walked straight back into a job with the ONS immediately afterwards, and he's been there ever since. So a really fantastic way for you to potentially get in with an employer. It might be the case that actually you go and work somewhere um, and you think, oh, let's say you're studying engineering, you go and work um, for you know, Nissan or Honda, or something like that, and you think, actually, you know, I, I don't really love the automotive industry. You know, I'd rather do something else with my future, in which case, you know, great. That's absolutely fine. At least at that point, you've had the chance to try out a particular career path uh, and work out maybe what is for you and what's not for you in the in that particular industry. So, you know, do do consider this, especially if you are doing those industry focused courses like, you know, engineering, um, sciences, computer science, STEM subjects, essentially. But I will also say that this isn't just limited to industrial kind of focused subject. You know, it's called the year in industry, but it might be more helpful to just think of it as a placement year because you can be studying something like you know, history or drama or art, things that aren't, you know, industrial, um, but you can still want to do some really, really fantastic placements as part of that course. Other things as well to bear in mind, um, things that universities might offer like year in courses. Um, for example, at the University of Kent, you can take a year out from your degree and essentially study still at the university, but in another discipline. So if you were studying um, politics, but you maybe were considering a career in political journalism, you could take a year out from your politics degree go and do a year in journalism and then either do that at the end of your politics degree or come partway through your politics degree and then come back and finish your original subject. So again, these are the kind of opportunities that universities can offer you. These year out programs can be something, again, that makes a course a bit more unique, whether it's a year abroad, a year in industry or a year in course. See what kind of options universities can offer you on the courses that you're interested in, because again, different universities will have different numbers of industrial placements they can do on their courses or different kinds of year in options. So this can be a way for you to maybe, you know, separate two courses that are quite similar at two different universities, because a year in industry can be something that really makes you stand out, makes your experience a lot more unique, something that you might be very, very interested in. So thinking a bit more practically then, how do we go about finding this information? As I've already said a few times, university websites are a fantastic resource. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but really the first kind of practical step to choosing a course uh, will probably be to visit the UCAS website. That's where the course search is. That's where you can see all those 35,000 odd different courses. So you can go in there, search just by keyword, or you can search by university as well. Um, and you can find out everything that's on offer for you. With that, you can see the entry requirements. Hopefully that can already help you eliminate some potential courses um, just based on what they're asking for in terms of available and in terms of the subjects and the grades that you need. And then from there, you can also do things like ordering a prospectus or view prospectuses online. I'll talk about those in just a second. And then visiting the university is a really, really fantastic thing to do. Something I really strongly recommend. And I'm going to talk a lot more about open days in just a second. Um, but hopefully, you know, through all these different methods here, this brings you to a point where you can make some informed choices around what some of your best options might be.
So just a few research tools that might be helpful for you to kind of get the lay of the land. We've got things like Discover Uni. This is a tool created by the government just to help do at a glance comparisons of different universities. So you can stack one course next to another. You can see basic information like entry requirements, as well as things like if you can do a year abroad or you're in industry, all kinds of different stuff like that. And then from there, you can get a bit more of a deeper look into that university and you can go to their website, all that kind of stuff. We also do have a number of different league tables here in the UK. Um, so things like Times Higher Education, Guardian, Complete University Guide are probably the three best known ones. They release rankings every year for all the universities in the country and around the world in some cases. What I would say is league tables can be a helpful resource, but it's worth um, taking them with a grain of salt or it's worth not just relying too heavily on one because different universities will place different emphasis on certain criteria or they assess universities based on different criteria, I should say. It might be that one leans a lot more on student satisfaction Whereas another one might lean a lot more on, let's say, you know, research quality and intensity um, to determine the overall quality of a university. So rather than just looking at one, it's probably helpful to take a kind of an average across multiple different ones to see how a university stacks up. And what I will also say is that it's better to rely on specific school or department rankings than overall university rankings, because it might be that a university has a fairly average ranking, but the specific apartment, the apartment department uh, that you are applying to um, is much, much higher ranked. So, for example, um, at the University of Kent, our ranking is currently kind of in the mid 40s on average across all these. Um, however, for our law department, um, law is actually a top 25 um, department in the country. So if you were somebody that's interested in studying law, Kent is actually a very, very good option for you. Alternatively, you know, somewhere, you know, if you're looking into environmental sciences, for example, um, you might automatically think that you know the best universities for that are always going to be Oxford, Cambridge, um, you know, some of the London universities. But actually, um, UEA is really the, the, the European leader in um, environmental sciences, for example. So that would be the best option for you, even if their overall ranking isn't going to be number one um, for that particular course. It very much would be. So do bear that kind of thing in mind and look a bit deeper into lead tables. Don't just take them at face value. And also don't just go off of the kind of general preconceptions that you or family members or friends might have about certain universities. Because these league tables are constantly changing, constantly being updated as well. So do bear that in mind. Course websites or university websites um, are very, you know, very um, fantastic resource these days. You know, these are really the main port of call for you now when it comes to finding out the information about a university or about a particular course. On course pages, uh, what every university should have an individual page for all of their courses, where you'll find things like entry requirements, you know, teaching method and assessment, what modules you can do on that particular course, as well as things like you know, graduate career prospects, maybe some testimonials from students who've done those courses. So university websites these days should probably be your main port of call for finding out information about what a course is about and what it requires. Prospectuses were kind of the predecessor to the university website. This is effectively a big guidebook um, all about a particular university. So you have information in there about all the different um, courses, all the different you know, facilities at the university, things like entry requirements, what things you can do on that course. Obviously, there's only so much content you can actually fit into a physical book. So there might not be quite as much detail as you would get on the university's website. But these are the kind of things you can pick these up at UCAS fairs. Uh, you get them at school careers fairs. Universities hand these out by the thousands every year, or you can download them online as well. So you can get a PDF copy instead if you want, again, that kind of one stop helpful, um, all in one guide to a particular university. And then open days, um, a really, really fantastic opportunity to take hold of, especially now that we're in the post COVID world, if we dare say that. Um, this is now something that's accessible to us again. We had about two years where people couldn't visit universities, but now. And that's an opportunity open to you. So what I'd really strongly recommend is go to university open days. You know, you don't have to go to every single one, but maybe try and go to, you know, two or three or four of your best choices if you can do. So this is information again, you can book onto these on university websites. Generally speaking, they'll be free. Um, your travel will be the only thing that you need to cover. In some cases, that your university will also subsidize your travel or they might run coaches from big cities um, out to their university open day, for example. But do go to open days um, if you can. You know, you can go and actually see the place in person. You can chat to academics. You can chat to current students. 
you can see other non-academic facilities as well things like sports facilities social spaces that kind of thing because you know university websites are great and prospectuses and all those other resources youtube videos and that kind of thing but there is really no substitute for actually being there in person in the physical space um, and getting a sense for what it's like so do go to open days um, if you get the opportunity opendays.com is a really really good resource it's a website that lists all the open days happening in the country um, across all the different universities so you, it might be that you know you can see certain ones that might be in the same area on the same weekend or something like that so you can maybe kill two birds with one stone um, but again do look into open days really really can't recommend it highly enough okay so having thought about um, you know the academic side of life about how courses are set up and how they differ between different universities and also how to actually go about finding the information uh, let's just turn to the sort of the non-academic side of life and have a quick think about you know maybe how to choose a location um, or choose a university for the you know the non-academic criteria so here in the uk um, university is set up around one or two models and that's going to be a campus or a city university so here in this top picture, this is a picture of our Canterbury campus down here at the University of Kent. Uh, and with a campus university, that's where everything is in one location. The university is a kind of self-contained unit and everything's in one place. Uh, whereas with a city university, um, that's where you've got all the university facilities spread out across potentially you know, a large urban area. So in this bottom image, this is a picture of Sheffield, incidentally my hometown. Uh, and the University of Sheffield is spread out across quite a lot of this area. So a lot of the different buildings in there um, are university buildings. Now, there is no right or wrong answer to this. I'm not here to say that campus universities are objectively better than city universities. That's not true. Again, this is a case of it depends entirely on who you are and what you want from a university experience, because whichever you go to, campus or city, that will probably have quite a big impact on you know, the overall vibe of that university, the feeling of what it's like to live and study there and you know be in that place. Because again, what I want to point out is that university isn't just about what you study, but it is about where you study. It's about where you live, where you have to go and do your shopping how easy it is to meet up with people socially, things like that. So make sure that you are thinking beyond just what courses does this university have and what do I need to get in, but rather what's it actually going to be like to live and work in this place for three, four, maybe even longer years. And that's something we're going to be drawing out in the next few slides. So as I said, with a campus university, um, this is where everything is all in one place. So the advantage of this is that it's very convenient in a practical sense. It means that you know, you've know you got everything on site, like academic facilities, you know, your library, science labs, workshops, se seminar rooms, and lecture theatres, as well as accommodation, probably. You're also going to have, perhaps, social facilities. So on our campus, you know, we've got cafes, bars, restaurants, there's a nightclub on campus, cinema, sport facilities, performing arts centre, all that kind of different stuff. It's all in one place, like a little kind of student town or village in its own right. So it means that you're probably living, you know, five minutes walk away from where some of your lectures are taking place. The people that you're meeting in first year who are also living on campus, chances are they probably live within half a mile of you. So very, very easy in a, both an academic and a social sense to get around and do the things that you want to do. With that, it also means that on campuses, there can often be quite a nice sense of self-contained sort of student community, got a tangible university identity, you know, what we sometimes call like a sort of student bubble, because you're going around this space it's generally going to just be other students and staff members, people associated with the university. You're not kind of mixed in with whole loads of just general random members of the public, but rather the people in this place are associated with the university, as I say. So it's got that very university sense. Now, this obviously does have some disadvantages as well. It might mean that in a practical sense, you're a bit further away from some other things that you might want. So being a campus, you've got some facilities on site, but you might be a bit further from, you know, big shopping centres, cinemas, stadiums, public transport hubs, especially. Um, it might be in some cases you'll get some campuses that are a bit out in the middle of nowhere and maybe it's a 20 minute bus journey to the nearest town. So if you're thinking about maybe traveling to and from that campus, then think about how easy is it actually going to be getting there and back. Also, with it being a bit of a student bubble and a kind of self-contained university place, it's potentially going to be less well integrated with the local community and with the local area as well. So if you're perhaps really invested in the idea of uh, you know, moving to university and experiencing what it's like living in a big city um, or moving to a particular region, you know, you want to see what it's like living in Scotland, going to university, just going to a campus where everyone's a student, nobody's actually from there um, and you're not meeting any of the locals, it might take you out of that experience a little bit um, because you're in that student bubble, as I say. So you're not mixing in with members of the public quite as much. You're not getting as much of a sense of what it's like to you know, be in that particular place because you're, at, because you're on a university campus instead. 
And then with the City University here in this picture, we've got a picture of um, Portsmouth. You can see some of these purple highlighted buildings. Those are um, the university buildings themselves. So the purple highlighted buildings are University of Portsmouth facilities. Everything else you can see the unlighted highlighted buildings. And those are just general buildings. So they're offices, residences, shops, businesses, all those kinds of different things. So the university is just mixed in with everything else in the city. Now, again, this has advantages because it can mean that you get kind of a broader range of locations, a broader experience of being in that particular place. It might be that in the morning you've got a, a lecture down at the dockyard and then later that day you've got a seminar next to a city park in the afternoon. Your accommodation might be in another part of the city entirely. So you get go around a little bit more, get a bit more of a varied experience over generally might be a larger area as well than if you're at a university campus. This also might mean you've got easier access to um, you know, things like public transport hubs that I mentioned, big shopping centres, cinemas, stadiums, big facilities and public attractions that you might not be able to get on a university campus. And with that, you're also, because you're living in the city, you know, you're mixed in with other members of the community much more closely. You know, as you're going around the streets and into different places, you're going to be just rubbing shoulders with people who just live and work there, who have nothing to do with the university. So non-students gives you a chance to meet people outside the university, perhaps a bit more easily as well. So it gives you more of a sense of what it's like to live in a certain place, get a feel for that city, get a feel for that community. Um, and again, really invest in the culture and the vibe of where it is that you're living. Now, thinking in a practical sense, again, this does have some disadvantages. It might mean that, you know, as I said, everything's a bit more spread out. Your lecture and seminars might be in completely different locations, so it might be a bit harder to get around. It might be that your lecture in the morning is a 20 minute bus journey away from your next seminar, and then your accommodation is a 15 minute bus journey from there onwards in another direction. So in a practical sense, it might take you a bit longer to get to places and not going to be quite as convenient in that sense. And also because the facilities are going to be spread out over a city, you've got a less centralized student community. So maybe a less tangible sense of that kind of student bubble university identity because you know you're just mixing in with other members of the public you're kind of another small cog in the big city machine as it were so you're not just seeing other students but you're seeing all kinds of other people as well now with this you know as i said there's advantages and disadvantages to both models and it's not that one is better than another it just depends entirely what it is that you're looking for so if for me myself i mean i really wanted to go to a campus university campus was absolutely the right choice for me because that was you know, the vibe that I was going for from my university experience. But for other people, the city would absolutely be a fantastic choice for them instead. And there are always going to be qualifying factors for all of these two. There's variances even within these two models. So with the campus university, you'll get some campuses that are absolutely massive and have loads and loads of facilities. You'll get some that are quite small um, and maybe don't have as much going on. Similarly, you get some campuses that are out in the middle of nowhere, you know, maybe they're 20, 30 minutes drive from the nearest town or city. But you also get some campuses where they're right next to a town. For example, our Canterbury campus is only 20 minutes walk from the city centre of Canterbury. Or even in the case of, you know, University of Birmingham, let's say, their campus is actually embedded in the city itself. So it's a campus whereby everything's in one place, but it's immediately surrounded by the city of Birmingham. So it's kind of variances within that. And again, even within the city university model, there's obviously going to be big differences in the size of city that you go to. Go to university in London, Manchester, Leeds, let's say, um, will be quite different to going to a smaller city like Aberystwyth or Falmouth, let's say. And within the, the city university model, oftentimes while everything is spread out, universities will sometimes have particular areas or kind of university hubs where even if not everything is in that one location, they've got a lot of their stuff. So for example, at Sheffield, um, they have a kind of their main student union bar and a lot of their facilities in one particular location kind of within half a square mile. Uh, even if some of their other facilities are spread out a bit more. So there might not be one location for everything, but there will be certain locations around the city where there is that bit more sense of a student community and student area being there. So different kind of qualifying factors, even within these models, worth bearing in mind. Accommodation is obviously a big part of the university experience. Um, you know, some people will choose to stay at home and commute to their university. That's absolutely fine. Um, but for most people, they will move away to university and this will be their first time tracking out into independent living, being away from family, friends and that kind of thing. And the type of accommodation that you go into will have, again, quite a big bearing on you know, what your experience of living at university is like, it kind of goes without saying. So some universities uh, might be you know, a bit younger, as it were. So those that were founded in the last hundred years, we're talking, you know, Kent is an example, but also maybe Essex, UEA, Sussex, places like that. Their accommodation is always going to be a bit more modern. So they might have things like ensuite bathrooms, double glazing, central heating, because they were built a bit more recently. And that might be something that you're really kind of wanting in a practical sense. You know, you just want those kind of home comforts. Or it might be that actually you're really invested in going to 
somewhere that's a bit more unique, maybe a bit more rustic. You know, you've got some universities like Oxford, Cambridge, Durham, you know, Royal Holloway that have stood for hundreds of years. You know, their accommodation is obviously going to be a bit more um, historic. It's going to have a lot more heritage to it, maybe a bit more character. Uh, it looks a bit more like you're going somewhere that's, you know, looks like Hogwarts, uh, but maybe not quite as practical in some senses. So again, it's not worth, you know, sorry, it's not it's not saying, uh, you know, there's a right or a wrong answer to this. You know, it's just entirely about what you want out of your experience. Maybe you've got a really clear picture of what you imagine, you know, going to university to be like and what, you know, you imagine your university room to look like. So do look into what different kinds of accommodation universities can offer you. Um, because again, different types of rooms, different types of setups will have a big bearing on your overall university experience. So here's just a quick look at um, you know, some of the options available at the University of Kent, just as an example, but the same will go for lots of different universities around the country. It might be that one particular university only has one kind of accommodation. They just have a standardized format. Everybody has the exact same room and they're all in the same place. However, other universities might have you know, 20 different types of room that you can apply for. There's all kinds of different options available to suit your needs or your different price points. So again, see what different universities have to offer. There are things to bear in mind, like you know, some universities will have ensuite rooms. So you've got uh, your, your bedroom, study space, a little ensuite bathroom, and then you might have a shared kitchen living space or something like that. Uh, things like you know, five and six bed houses with shared bathroom accommodation is an example of something that we have at the University of Kent. We've got an upstairs and a downstairs bathroom that you share with maybe two other people. And then maybe alternatively, you've also got some universities will have much bigger wash facilities, you know, similar to, you know, big shower rooms like you might have a gym or a sports facility or something like that. So again, different models that universities are using. Catering is another example of this. So a lot of university accommodation will be self-catered, whereby you buy all your own groceries, you store them in the fridge, you cook all your three meals a day, you take care of that entirely by yourself. But alternatively, there's also oftentimes catering options available at different universities too. So it might be that you pay a bit more money to the university and then either you, you know, maybe all go down and have your food in a big canteen somewhere and you just get your meals prepared for you each day, or you go and get meals at different kind of restaurants or cafes around the campus. Maybe you only have two meals a day prepared for you. Different variances within this, you know, again, it's appreciate that for some people going away to university and catering for yourself entirely for the first time might be quite daunting. You know, it might be that actually you haven't cooked for yourself much before. So something like a catering package, if a university offers that to you, uh, might be quite helpful to you. Um, you know, cooking for yourself is, is a really important skill, so I'd recommend looking into if you can. Um, something that will serve you quite well. It does always lead to some good hygiene, especially in first year, though. Um, there was a guy I knew when I was at university who he thought that to make soup, you just pour soup into a kettle and then flick it onto the boil and the, and the soup cooks up. Now, that's, unfortunately, that's not how soup gets made. His housemates weren't very happy. Something like a catering option might be quite good for somebody like that. Um, so do think about what needs um, the university can meet for you and when it comes to your living situation as well. And as I already touched on this, um, I won't spend too much time on this, but again, visiting the university um, is a really, really important step to take, um, especially when it comes to finding out more about the actual living situation. If anything, I'd say that visiting the uni is more about finding out about you know, the accommodation, about the city itself, about travel, than it is about finding out about the course. The core stuff is you know, what you, you can get a lot of that from um, you know, the website, from videos, things like that actually being in the physical space and seeing what it's like at that university on that campus or in that city um, is something that you can't replicate other than actually going there and doing it in person. So going to open day is a really good resource to you know find out how easy it is to get there and back. It might be that you know you look at the map and think this university is really easily accessible but when you try and drive there it's actually all little windy country roads and it's an absolute nightmare and it takes you twice as long as you were thinking. It might be that actually it's more expensive than you imagine getting to a particular university on the train, let's say. So if you're somebody that's thinking of going um, to and from home quite often during term time, this might factor into your decision making. And also just other things as well, like, you know, obviously universities will only ever use the nicest pictures they've got of their accommodation of their students, you know, but you might turn up on a particular day and it turns out there's actually a massive building site just across the street from the accommodation that they didn't show you in any of the pictures. And that's going to be there for the next five years. So again, worth bearing in mind these different things that you can't necessarily glean from online content. Really, really good opportunities to not just see the university itself, but also a bit more in the local area too. And you can see what the city is like that that campus is close to, for example, all that kind of stuff as well. So really do strongly recommend going and visiting um, universities in person as much as you can. Just a few other things, I already kind of touched on some of these, but you know, if you are thinking about going home a lot, um, how easy, how expensive is it to get home if you need to? 
you know, is it close to other family and friends? Maybe do you know other people from your school or college perhaps that have already gone to that university? Or do you have people that you want to go to university with or be close to potentially? You know, how expensive is it? Obviously going to university somewhere like London will be considerably more expensive in terms of cost of living than going to university in the north of England, let's say. So if financial concerns are on your mind, maybe choosing a university in up north might be a bit better for you. But really, you know, the question that you want to be asking yourself is, you know, is this somewhere that I can see myself living for three, four, maybe even longer years? Because at the end of the day, as I keep saying, university is not just about the course you're studying. It's about doing the mundane stuff like going shopping, uh, getting your laundry sorted out about, yeah, going and getting trains and traveling to and from, as well as, you know, the fun stuff like socializing, getting involved with sports, all that kind of thing as well. Just a few other things to draw your attention to that make the university a bit more unique. Um, again, I appreciate we're coming down on the end of our time and I will do want to have some time for the Q&A. But things like, you know, what the student union is like um, at the university, I'll talk about that in just a second. What kind of societies and support students do they have available? How is the student support at that particular university, especially if you're somebody that might have need of additional support when you go to university? Student support, support facilities um, are a really, really important thing to look into, as well as things around employability, other financial incentives like scholarships, kind of university give you money in exchange for maybe your sporting or your musical abilities or your academic attainment. And again, just that kind of that other thing I touched on when we talked about accommodation about, you know, just particularly unique locations, facilities, you know, places that are very historic and have a lot of heritage. That might be something that you're really, really interested in studying in a place like that. Student support is something you should definitely look into when you are considering universities, whether that's academic support, helping you with study skills, what kind of schemes do universities have to ensure that you're getting the most out of your course? Or whether that's welfare support, if you're a student with a physical disability, what kind of support can they give you in terms of both accessing learning space and also living space? As well as if you will have learning disabilities, if you're a student with dyslexia, ADHD, um, dyscalculia, whatever it might be, you know, what guarantees can universities give you around helping you access learning and being assessed on an even keel with everybody else? There might be other forms of support that are more pastoral as well, so things like mental health support, if you're somebody that suffers from anxiety, depression, whatever else it might be, universities have a responsibility of care to their students and they actually do get assessed on the quality of their student support um, services. So Times Higher Education award the outstanding support for students each year. So do look into what universities' reputations are like, not just in an academic sense, but in also in terms of the support they offer to their students as well, because it might be that one university can really, really take care of you well and cater to the specific needs that you have. And also career support as well. Obviously, most people go to university with the aim of going into the job market afterwards and getting a career of some kind out of their degree. So what kind of assistance, what kind of career services does a university have? Again, they'll be assessed on this. There are awards given every year around career services. So you can see which universities have the best career services. What kind of advice can they give you? How can they help you with networking? What events do they run throughout the year to help you meet employers and make the connections that you need to? The student union is a thing you should definitely look into alongside the university. It's something that sometimes goes a little bit under the radar, but whereby you've got the university itself that runs the academic side of life. The union exists in parallel with the university, but they run a lot of the social and student voice side of things. They'll offer that a lot of that same advice and support that I just talked about, whether it's around welfare, housing, mental health, that kind of thing. Also things around employability. So how much help can a student union give you um, around getting a job, for example? How many students do they themselves employ if you want to get part-time work while you're at university? And again, what kind of social facilities, what kind of social events do they run? So what societies and sports teams are there? What kind of big events do they do through the year? Do they do any kind of social activism or volunteering? Do they invest in causes that you're particularly into? I would say that when you're looking at a university, you should look at the student union in just as much detail because the student's union will give you a really good insight into the social and the student life experience um, at that university beyond just what happens on your course. So do look into that very carefully, but they often have their own website. They'll release a lot of their own content as well. They, again, sometimes fly under the radar a little bit, as I said. So do look into what the student's union at the university you're interested in is called and look at their own website as well. Societies and sports teams won't dwell on this for too long, but really, really big part of the university experience, really fantastic opportunity to either A, carry on an existing hobby that you have, or B, start something up for the first time. So do look into what different clubs, societies and groups are available at a particular university, because it might be that, you know, there's a really fantastic fencing club at a given university. And if you're already into that and you want to carry it on, you already play quite competitively, 
then that'd be a really good opportunity for you to go to that particular university. So again, these will be listed on, on student union websites, not university websites themselves, but student union websites. So do go to there and see what kind of stuff you can be involved with when you're at that university, how you can fill your time outside the course and what kind of you know exciting social opportunities you might be able to get. Sports on the other side of the coin when it comes to this. Sports are a big part of the university experience. What kind of facilities a university have will often determine what kind of sporting activities you can get involved with. Again, different teams and groups will all be listed on um, you know, student union websites and things about specific sport facilities might be listed on a university's website or they will have their own sports department that you can look into. But you know, again, for example, if you're somebody that's particularly into swimming, then looking into universities that have their own swimming pool will be a really good way for you to narrow down your options. Other kind of incentive programs that universities have as well around, you know, for example, at the University of Kent, if you're a first year living on campus, you get free unlimited sports membership. So that's full gym membership, access to all the pitches, the tennis center, all that kind of stuff. Other universities might run similar schemes. So do look into what kind of um, incentive they can give you, what kind of discounts you can get to access things like the gym. And again, a fantastic opportunity for you to continue existing sports activity you might do, or perhaps start something up for the first time as well. So do see, because different universities will have different levels of sports available to you, <coughs> excuse me, um, based on the other facilities. So some big universities will have tons of sport facilities, really, really good access, whereas smaller universities might not have quite as much they can offer you. So do bear that kind of thing in mind if you are sportingly inclined as well. So again, just some final key considerations to make around the student life, the non-academic side of the university, you know, things like, again, yeah, are sport facilities suitable for you? Are you going to be able to continue existing hobbies or activities that you do, or are you going to have good opportunities to start something up that's new that you've been looking into maybe already and wanting to do for a while? What is the nightlife like in the area? But it's not just about nightlife. You know, that is the kind of stereotypical student life, student social activities, going out clubbing in the evening. But that's not for everybody. So what else actually is there on offer in terms of like stuff in the daytime, for example? What is there around student well-being and other social activity and based around your specific preferences and needs? And again, that's stuff that a student union should be advertising on their website. And what is the cost of living? Again, I already touched on this, but you know, how cheap or expensive is it going to be to go on a night out, for example? How expensive is a gym membership at that particular university? So just to sum things up then, again, I appreciate we're coming to the end of our time. We'll try and get some questions as soon as we can. But again, what I say is don't just look at course titles. Make sure that you scratch beneath the surface and see what they actually teach on that course and how they teach it. Remember that university isn't just about academic life. You know, you've also got to live in that place for three, four years, potentially. You've got to do the mundane stuff like doing your shopping, doing your laundry, traveling around. And it's also about the non-academic side of life as well. And it's about you know, societies, sports teams, part-time jobs that you can get. It's about meeting people, getting together with friends, going out in the evening, all kinds of different stuff. So don't just look at the course. Don't just ask, you know, what I, what I often get asked at events and I like, go to for UCAS, like kind of thing is just, you know, do you do this course and what are the entry requirements? And I, I'll, you know, I, I can tell you that, but you know, university is about so much more than just the course. It's about whole life experience of three, four years, about learning, not just how to become an expert in your given field, but also, you know, how to get on in the adult world and how to take care of yourself when you're living independently. I so, say, you know, don't rush, take your time on this. You know, you do have a good amount of time ahead of you to do some research over the next few months. There are open days coming up throughout the summer that you can attend. So use all the resources available to you. You're probably the best informed generation. You probably have access to more information than anybody ever has before when it comes to choosing a university, which is a bit overwhelming, but it also means that you're very well placed to make sure that you can make an informed decision. And when it comes to making that decision, I would just say, you know, really trust your instincts. You know, I'd say you're the one that has to do this. You're the one that has to live with the consequences of your decision, um, whether they be good or bad um, for future years. You know, as much as it is good to get advice from, you know, friends, teachers, parents, whatever it might be, you know, you're the one that knows what you want out of your university experience. You know what you've got in your mind's eye. And when it comes to where you want to be living, what kind of course you want to be studying, that kind of thing. So really make sure that this is a decision that you are happy with. First and foremost, that you're not making this decision for somebody else, but rather it's a decision that you're going to be happy with. It's going to be a course that you're satisfied with for three, four years, and then maybe even longer into the rest of your life as well. OK, so I think we have a few minutes. So, Heather, I don't know if you want to jump back online if you've got any questions. Well, so I have yeah. gone on slightly long there, but it was uh, hopefully that's covered a lot of content people were asking about. It has, yeah. And there was, the, I mean, I don't know whether you've seen the chat box at all. Um, but it's, we've been inundated and a lot of the questions you have answered as you've kind of gone through the presentation. But there's also quite a lot that I would like to try and rattle through now, kind of quick fire style, if yeah, that's OK. Um, so more, on a more general um, note, um, Sammy said, what percentage of student satisfaction? How does that compare with other uni rankings? 
Sure. So, Julian, in terms of how, so the, the student satisfaction at a given university um, will, yeah, will, will depend on things like national student survey and that kind of thing. I can't say off the top of my head which ranking tables prize student satisfaction above the others. I want to say that may be complete university guide. Use it a little bit more than others. Um, but if you go onto university ranking sites, you'll be able to see um, they should have notes about their methodology and their criteria. And, and also they'll often break down even on a university kind of ranking chart table, they'll show rankings based on different criteria as well. So you can just filter for student satisfaction and see which one has high student satisfaction um, really? on that list in particular. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but hopefully that's, that's really helpful, helpful actually, because that's a source for absolutely every uni then, isn't it? So that's great. Um, Mo asked whether teaching is um, online in any way now, or has it all gone back to in-person after COVID? Sure. So I say that again, that will depend on, um, you know, what university you're going to. Um, speaking from our own experience here at Kent, I think everything is pretty much back to in-person learning now. Um, things are still recorded and still put online for those that might not be able to access for whatever reason. Um, but generally speaking, I would say at this point, we seem to be back to normality. But again, that varies based very much on the university that you're applying to, again, as to whatever their policies might be. But yeah, so yeah, the good news is that I think especially for the coming September intake and even thinking further beyond, um, for some of these folks, um, things are very much back to the kind of pre-COVID model that we had, I'm pleased to say. Wonderful. That's good news. Um, there was a, a quick question about ways to apply, just to confirm it is on UCAS, it's not on the university website itself, is it? Yeah, correct. Unless you're an international student, um, sometimes you can apply directly through university websites. But for UK home students, all applications have to be done by UCAS, yeah. Okay. Um, there's questions about um, employment so um, and connections with um, employment networks. So Anna said, first of all, what percent of your grads go on to employment after completing a degree with you? Mm -hmm. So specifically at the University of Kent, I think yeah. across the whole university, um, I think it's about 95% of our students go on to either full-time employment or further study within six months of graduation. And then within specific academic schools, um, that might be um, even higher. So, for example, our journalism course um, has an absolutely fantastic um, employment rate, um, maybe not quite 100%, but close to it um, for journalists going into that field, for example. So, again, that's stuff that's important to look at when I was talking about not just looking at a university's overall ranking or stats, but within the specific department that you're applying to as well, because it might be that actually a university's, let's say, law department has really, really fantastic employment stats, even better than the overall university ranking. But yeah, about 95%, I think, for the university as a whole. Brilliant. Um, there was a question around what kind of subjects Kent specifically specialise in? Yeah, absolutely. So we have well, over 400 different programmes of study, so quite a broad range. But um, our, well, some of our best uh, departments, I'd say, are the law school. So I'd say we're a top 25 law school in the country. Um, our business school is our biggest department as well. They're triple accredited by all the main bodies for management and accountancy. That's a really good marketing management courses, um, accounting and finance, that kind of thing. Um, our psychology department is also accredited by the British Psychological Society. So we offer courses in general psychology as well as clinical and forensic psychology. Um, and our history department actually as well, where I myself studied, was just ranked first in the country for research quality um, and intensity in the as of pretty much last week actually or the week before in the research excellence framework um so those are just some of them um, a lot of really really good courses and um, I, I couldn't possibly list them all as much as i would like to um, but yeah <laughs> history psychology business law some of the top ones that come off the top of my head yeah brilliant um sarah said it's quite a specific question do you have links with the armed forces i'm interested in joining the raf after uni and i hear they offer student scholarships mm -hmm. sure so armed forces bursaries they're not tied to specific universities as it were rather you apply uh, kind of before or concurrently with your application and then they can support you with bursaries to whichever university it is that you go to now if, if you are thinking about a career in the armed forces i will say that there are certain things to bear in mind so things like the officer training corps or the air training corps um, or university air training corps some universities will be better than others in that they will have closer links with maybe a local um, army reserve center or officer training corps center or things like that so that's the kind of stuff that should hopefully be um kind of again accessible through student union websites they'll list things like the otc there um so do look into that but when it comes to these financial support the armed forces bursaries those aren't university specific rather you just apply for it and then you apply to whichever university you want to 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, Jonathan, <laughs> we've only got two, two minutes officially left of the session, but we've got a few more questions I think we'll go over. Are you yeah. okay with time? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I've, yeah, I'm in okay. no so just a note to anybody that's here that's got to go, um, I'm going to go through all of the questions that have been asked. And if you haven't had one answer, answer to yet, then you've got to leave. Remember that the session's been recorded and it'll be emailed to you. So you, you, you will find out the answer. Um, so I will, I, I'll crack on because um, time is of the essence. Um, Nicole asks, does the University of Kent have connections with employers and offer support to employment? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned careers and employability services um, previously. Kent has a really, really fantastic um, careers and employability service. They're quite a large, well-developed team. So they do things like they give you just general careers advice. If you want to know what your options might be post university, now they do things like mock interviews, help with CV writing and um, help with writing applications, whether that's two jobs or to further study. Um, for example, I got help from them when I was applying for my master's. Um, and then, yeah, they run a big um, Kind of careers fair every year as well so they turn one of the sports hall into um, a kind of exhibition center and then okay. um, employers come down from around the region and around the country and you can go around chat to them hand out your cv whether you know whether you're a first year just looking for an internship over the summer or whether you're a final year student who's looking for a graduate opportunity um yeah they run a really good service. they've actually won awards previously for um the career service specifically at university of kent brilliant um my, Michael said, do you do degree apprenticeships? I'm thinking of doing one. Would I still need to apply on UCAS? Sure, that's a really good question. So degree apprenticeships, well, the short answer is that, yes, we facilitate them both as an employer of apprentices and also as a provider for degree apprenticeships. The way that degree apprenticeships work are you don't apply to university, but rather you it's much more just like applying to a job and it's much more um, employment focused learning so the way it works is you there's there's a date there's databases online so the government have um, a list of all the different apprenticeships available in the country at any given time and you can filter for the degree ones you find one that's you know looks good to you whether that's you know science technician or working in accounting whatever it might be you apply through the employer and then that employer will have partnerships with a given university and that university is advertised on the on the job advert as well so it'll spit it'll say you know level five degree apprenticeship with Pearson's uh, and their higher education provider is, in this case actually, is the University of Kent. Uh, but it's the case that you don't apply to the university or you shouldn't go into a degree apprenticeship with a particular university in mind because the case is that the employer will just dictate which university it is that you're going to. And no, you don't apply to UCAS, you just apply through the job side of it. And then 20% of your time is done studying. So you do maybe four days a week just in the office or in the workshop, wherever it might be working. And then your other period of time might be spent. It might be online learning. You might be some in-person learning. Um, but yeah, the fact is, so we do run something that we employ apprentices as yeah, science technicians, um, other things around related around STEM. Um, and we also then obviously provide the degree content for that. Um, but then we facilitate learning. So we teach over 1200 apprentices from 400 different employers. Uh, around the country um, at the University of Kent as well but and it's a slightly long-winded answer to your question but um, in answer you apply through the employer it's more like applying for a job the university then comes in at a later stage and gets added on after you've got the apprenticeship. Brilliant thank you. Um, Bethany asked do practical courses have better employment opportunities or vice versa? Um, I think that well it depends really on, on the course that you've applied to or the, or the course that you're doing um, and you know it's it's hard to say so I think yeah if the hard stats would be that you know obviously things like you know we will always need engineers and architects and you know things like that um, so there are certain courses and trades that I think typically do have slightly better employment stats or at least um, employment in the field that you studied so if you study engineering you have a much I'd say you have a better chance of then getting a job in engineering than say somebody who studies history like I did getting a job in historical in, in heritage obviously I, I don't currently work in anything to do with my degree title you know I work in university recruitment um, so I'd say that employment overall um, is regardless any degree is going to be useful for you regardless of what you study um, it's going to help your job prospects uh, it just might be that practical courses might have a more course relevant, uh, might be better for course relevant employment going forward. Whereas other degrees like humanities, let's say, give you a more general skill set that you can take into maybe a broader range of areas, um, but it's not much of a distinctive kind of 
onward career progression as with some courses. Brilliant, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, right, we've got some questions around courses. Um, Shauna says, what happens if I apply to one of your courses and I don't get the grades required? Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, what I'd say is, you know, don't don't despair. Um, if it comes to results day, um, the university the universities actually get everybody's grades a week in advance, and um, what you don't necessarily realise. But so let's say you've applied for a course and you've got, you know, you're you're asked to get three Bs, and instead you've got BBC. Depending on the university that you applied to and the course you applied to, um, most of the time with that kind of situation, the university well, firstly the university will always re-review all applications. They don't just reject everybody out of hand. Um, and there will oftentimes be some flexibility around that is what I would say. Obviously, I'm speaking from my own experience. I can't speak for, you know, absolute top tier universities. So, you know, places like your Oxford, Cambridge, Durham, UCL, Kings, whatever it might be, um, those will be a bit more competitive. And in some cases, actually, even just getting the listed minimum entry requirements might not actually be enough. Um, but if you miss your grades, um, I'd say that firstly, um, Oftentimes, universities might have a bit of flexibility around that, depending on the course and the university you've applied to. But also, um, there will be other options to you. So clearing is a really, really good idea to look into, even if actually just looking, researching clearing in advance is something I would recommend, just in case, A, you know, yeah, something doesn't go as planned on results day. But B, actually, you might just change your mind as well and decide that actually on results day, um, maybe, or maybe in the weeks before, um, actually, I'd rather go to a different university anyway, just regardless of my grades, just for another reason entirely. Um, but clearing is absolutely a viable option. And it's something that used to be kind of looked down on a little bit um, for some reason, uh, but not anymore at all. Um, I would say it's very, very viable these days to go through clearing and there will be a course out there for you somewhere, even if it wasn't necessarily the university that you initially applied to. There's lots of fantastic opportunities for clearing, lots of really high quality courses that you can go to. And other things like foundation courses can also be a good idea. So that's whereby you just do another year at the start of the course. Uh, you're still a student, just like everybody else. You live in the same accommodation. You get treated the exact same. Um, but you just do another year at the beginning. It's a bit more introductory. It's a foundation, as the name suggests. And then after that, you progress on to the other three years of the degree, um, as you would do as normal. So it's a four-year course at that point. Um, but in, in some cases, um, if you apply to a course that has, um, again, let's say, you know, three Bs is the entry requirement. Let's say you miss that and you get three Cs. If that course has a foundation entry option, and that's something you can look at in advance, you can see that on their website, they might just say to you, you haven't got the grades to start in first year, but if you would like to do the foundation year, that's an option available to you um, as well. And you can then just, you can still get onto the course, you just have to do another year at the start instead. Um, so yeah, if it comes to results that you don't get your grades, don't give up hope, always contact the university as well. Um, they'll have hotlines open on results day where you can call them up. Um, and do chat to them and see if there's anything you can work out. Or they might be able to offer you a place on a different course in the same department, for example. Wonderful. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you very much. Um, on the subject of um, course, courses and assessments still, um, John T said, is there a way, um, sorry, is the way that you are assessed different at each university throughout, you know, for your course? Sure. I would say broad strokes, like it's going to be fairly similar methods across a lot of universities. So they're probably all going to use some form of exam, some form of coursework, or maybe practical assessment if you're doing, um, you know, performance based subject or kind of project based work. But it's the emphasis that they place on each of these is what will vary from university to university. So it might be that one places a lot more onus on coursework and dissertation on a certain course. So, for example, actually, um, in my final year of study, my dissertation was worth half the credits for that entire year. Whereas for the standard history course, it was only 25% or something like that. So my dissertation was actually a lot more valuable um, in terms of my overall mark than on another course, for example. Um, so while the methods will be similar, it's just the emphasis and the value that they place on each of them at different universities. Um, so if you're somebody that really loves coursework more than exam, going to a university that gives you opportunities to do 100% coursework assess modules, for example, might be something that's a good idea for you. Well, thank you. Um, John um, Smaller said, can you swap modules once started if you change your mind? Yeah, great question. So the, the short answer is yes, um, within limits. So generally, the way it works is at the start of the year, um, the university will say to you, you know, here's a list of 20 modules, um, pick, you know, five or six or seven of these, however many, um, and then you do that. And then it might be that within the kind of the first three weeks of the term, generally, I would say, there's options to switch between modules. Because it also, it might actually be that you pick modules at the end of, let's say you're in first year, at the end of first year, you might pick your modules for the next year. 
And then when you get to September, you might think, actually, now I'd rather do something else. So, yeah, there is scope to change within it. But obviously, if you've already studied eight weeks out of the 12-week term, and then you want to change modules, they'll probably say no because you've missed the first two-thirds of the content for that module. So you can change, but you have to do it sooner rather than later. Um, if it's before the term starts, then, then yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay, right. Um, just going back to um, actually assessment. So Megan asked, will the course description explain how you're ass ass assessed? Can't get my words out. <laughs> yes, it absolutely should do. Um, so that might be on the overall course description, or it might even be within specific uh, kind of module details as well. So for example, on our website, if you go to any course, you can see the full list of modules that are taught on it. And if you click it, if you click the, each individual module, it opens up and there's a whole other page with a lot more detail about how it's taught and assessed and that kind of thing. So assessment methods should be something that's emphasized on the university's course pages, um, both in general and then also within specific modules as well. Great stuff. Um, one final question on courses, and then I'll just do a little bit on um, placements and sandwiches, and then just a final note about Kent itself. Um, Nate said, is there a way to find out how many people will be on a course? Um, that's uh, that's a tricky one because it varies a lot from year to year. Um, what I would say is, you know, you can just contact universities, emailing them or going to an open day and asking in person is a good way to do that. Obviously, some courses will be more popular than others, but typically they will um, sometimes, actually, even on, even sometimes on those websites like Discover Uni um, or rankings, they will sometimes list kind of average class sizes there. Um, so some universities will provide that information just on their website. In some universities, you might have to ask for it. Um, but generally, it's, it's also know that some universities, oh, sorry, some courses obviously much more popular than others. So you'll get some, you know, my course was quite small and specific. So we had maybe 30, 40 students. The law course has about 500 uh, in a given year. Um, but again, that's information that universities might publish on their course page or on their website, or if not, you can contact them and ask that as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, now, just a couple of questions around placements and sandwiches. Um, Rich said, is a sandwich year abroad offered on all courses? And I believe that this question was in relation to Kent. Sure. So specifically at Kent, um, not all courses have year abroad options. Um, lots and lots of them do actually, though, I'd say definitely more than half. I'd say probably the majority of them. I can't think off the top of my head what the exact number is. Um, but they don't all have year abroad options just because of the nature of some of the courses. So for something like medicine, for example, um, they can't really have their students just taking a year out off not studying the content that they need to for the medicine course. And the same goes for some of the, the kind of STEM focused subjects. Um, but I'd say the vast majority of our courses have either a year abroad or a year in industry um, or both options available to them. Um, so what, if you go onto our website, there's all on every single course, there's options at the top to show you if it's got a foundation year, if it's got a year in industry, if it's got a year abroad or just a standard three year option. Um, so not every single course, no, but most of them. As well, so. Okay, great. And Mike said, do you have to pay tuition fees for a year abroad? So there are costs involved. Yes, so tuition fees um, will be set potentially, but it's kind of set on agreement between the home university and the overseas university. But there is also financial support available. So there are schemes run by the government, um, the Turing scheme, which has replaced the Erasmus scheme. And then also, for example, at Kent, um, there's a study abroad scholarship. Other universities might also be able to offer you certain kinds of financial support for studying abroad. So there are costs involved, but generally speaking, it doesn't tend to be any more expensive. In fact, it usually tends to be less expensive than um, a year of study in the UK, given the financial support that you can access. But okay. again, I will just clarify that by was saying it will depend on which university you go to and what university they send you to overseas, or you choose to go to overseas, um, and what kind of particular policies they might have. Sorry, Karen. Um, in terms of placements, um, Nina and Julie asked a very similar question, and it was around, does the university help find the placement slash employers, or do they have to do it themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So it's actually a little bit of both. Um, it's kind of a push and pull. So the university expects you to have a bit of initiative and, you know, go after some of those placements, um, you know, look into what opportunities you might be able to get, but they can also give you assistance with, you know, getting started with that. So they can, you know, give you contacts and they can give you lists of places where students have been previously. Um, so it's not the case that they just, you know, place a, you know, they just give you a placement into your lap and just say, here, you're going to IBM next year. Um, you know, you do have to take a bit of initiative on that. There's a bit of onus on you, but they will give you help with finding those placements. You're not just left completely to your own devices. Oftentimes they might have, you know, for example, in our business school, we have a specific placements coordinator who's a full-time member of staff. 
um, who helps students with their placements and also keeps an eye on them when they're out on placement as well. So there's help from the university, but there is also a bit of expectation that, you know, you take some initiative yourself because you are an adult at the end of the day um, at this point too. So it's, it's kind of both. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you everybody who's um, still here and, and, and saying thank you. Pauline, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, Jonathan, I'm just going to ask um, about your personal experience now before I just wrap up the session. There's um, a couple of questions around um, how you personally found studying um, at Kent yes. um, and what it's like to live in and what made you choose Kent over or the uni so if you could just spend a, you know a minute or so just explaining kind of your journey and, and the reasons why I think that'll be a lovely uh, mm -hmm. note for us to end on really. Yeah absolutely yeah I'd love to. Um, so yeah I mean I, I really really love my time um, at Kent. I, let me start by saying I don't just say all this stuff because I get paid to you know I do get paid to do my job um, but, you know, I wouldn't do this if I didn't actually believe what I was saying. So I did really have a fantastic experience at Kent. I absolutely love my course. I said I did a fairly specific um, course, military history, is what I was really, really interested in. Absolutely loved doing it. I stayed on and did my master's at the University of Kent as well. So I did an additional year. I still live in Canterbury now. So I moved here in 2013 um, for university. Um, but, you know, eight and a half, nine years later, um, I am still here. I'm currently speaking to you from my, my house in Canterbury. Um, really lovely location. I mean, the university itself, it was just that it was a fantastic student community. It was a really good sense of university identity is what I would say. That was very much what I was looking for was that campus life. It felt like I was at university. Um, when I was up on campus, the location itself is really lovely as well. You know, um, there's lots of, you know, really lush countryside. Kent is a lovely part of England. Um, I would say Canterbury itself, you know, for somebody like me who's into history and heritage and things like that, Canterbury is fantastic. Um, I originally came from Sheffield, so quite a large city, um, and it was a nice change of pace for me to come to a city where it was, you know, smaller than my hometown, so it was very easy to get around, I could get to know the place, um, but large enough that there was a lot going on, there's a lot of young people, there's two other universities in the city, uh, so a lot of students, a lot of people around. Um, but yeah, I, I genuinely did have a fantastic experience at Kent. The reason that I chose, um, you know, wasn't because, you know, any other university was worse, you know, let's say. Um, I, was, I looked at um, Kent and um, University of Birmingham, uh, which was offered a very similar course. And it was just that when I went and visited both, you know, it was going to the open day, actually, it was kind of an important thing. Um, you, know, it's, it's, you know, Birmingham is a fantastic university. I would have been very, very lucky to go there. Um, and it was the same entry requirements. It was just that um, I just preferred the feel of the campus when I came down to Canterbury. Um, I could just see myself living here and enjoying myself here um, for three, four years, you know, as I said, and not so that I wouldn't have enjoyed my time at Birmingham, you know, that would have been a, a great experience as well, I'm sure. Um, I, I just had a better feeling. It sounds a bit kind of uh, a bit mushy and a bit um, intangible, but um, that was just what it came down to then. It was the campus, it was, um, you know, the place itself. It wasn't so much about the course, really. They're both fantastic courses. Um, but, you know, I think what I will also add is that, you know, I think, you know, obviously this is a big decision um, and it's, you know, in some ways it's kind of the crossroads of your life. I can't imagine what my life would be like now if I hadn't have gone to the university that I did based on the people that I know, the places that I live, the job I do. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think there are thousands of fantastic courses, hundreds of fantastic universities out there around the country. And there's good opportunities. There's, there's a number of really good opportunities for everybody. I think some people sometimes think there's only one kind of perfect course for everybody. And you have to find your perfect soulmate course otherwise you're going to have a horrible time at university what i'd say is there's tons of great units there's tons of great courses um you know anybody can have a good experience um, at any university is what i would say it's like really it's about what you get out of it what you put in and wherever you go whatever course you do um, if you engage with university life both academically and non-academically if you put yourself out there you make an effort to meet people um then you'll have a good experience of it and it's not the case of there's one perfect option for everybody i'd say there's a number of really good options for a lot of people um, it's just about finding out which ones are best based on what's important to you. Um, but anyway, so again, another slightly long-winded answer, but hopefully that was um, helpful. Well, I think it's been very helpful, and I think that your advice and experiences, um, it's, you know, like gold dust, really, so thank you. Um, I think this is um, my opportunity to, to thank everybody who's attended the session. Um, you've been a wonderful crowd, um, lots of questions. I do hope that you've all found it interesting and informative, and I'd like to thank University of Kent for running this session and you in particular Jonathan you've been fantastic I don't think there's a stone that hasn't been turned 
Um, so, so thank you so much. Obviously, this is the first session of the week. Um, we jam packed throughout the whole of the week. So I'll be hosting the line share of the sessions this week. So anybody here that's saying goodbye now, if you want to pop on at 12 o'clock, I'll see you again. Um, but yeah, Jonathan, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Um, and, and yeah, thank you and, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great speech, everybody. Later. Have a good day. Bye.